Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah and Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. Marcia Austin, are you online for opening prayer? Hallelujah. Marcia, are you online for opening prayer? Shabbat Shalom, praise be to God, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you, Lord, for caring for us. For bringing us to this point where we have a Where we are served you, Lord God. Lord, we are so grateful for all that you've done and all that you're doing. Thank you, God, for, for Pastor Israel, for all that you're doing in her life. We care for her and her household. And Father God, for having her to give us your word and your truth. Father, we're grateful, entirely grateful. Father, we ask that you heal us where we need to be healed. Thank you, Lord, for watching our thoughts. We give praise and honor and glory to you. In the name of your soul, we pray. Amen.
Hi everybody, I'm Bill Cloud. Welcome once again to On This Day. Today is the 17th day of Cheshvan, and according to many traditions, this day is the day that the flood of Noah began. Let me read for you in Genesis chapter 7. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And on the very same day, Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Yahweh, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons, went with him and entered the ark. Now, I want to point out very quickly that there are those who disagree with this tradition. Some feel that the flood came in the springtime of the year, the second month following the month of Aviv. Well, that's not what we're here to argue. We're going to focus what the scripture tells us, and mainly two points and not just the scripture, but the whole story of the flood, I, I guess I should say. The first thing is that death to men means life to mankind. When Adam was expelled from the garden, it was with the understanding that this had to happen or else he could take hold of the tree of life and eat and then live forever. But to live forever would have been, at that point in time, in a fallen, corrupt state. And that was what the Creator could not allow to happen. I mean, could you imagine what the world would be like today if Adolf Hitler, if men like Joseph Stalin and others could live forever? What would the world be like? So then, man's expulsion from the garden wasn't so much a punishment to men as much it, as it was the hope of redemption for mankind. Likewise, the flood of Noah, yes, it meant death to men but it made it possible for mankind to go on and, more importantly, be redeemed. The second thing that occurs to me in the story of Noah is that Noah wasn't surprised at the approach of the flood. He wasn't even surprised the day it all started. He had advance warning. He knew exactly when it was going to happen. And I believe that is very important for us to, to grab hold of, especially if we believe that we're living in the last days. Because Yeshua said that the days of his coming would be like the days of Noah. So then, Noah wasn't taken by surprise. So, aren't we to be taken by surprise when God's judgment does come? Well, here's what Paul has to say about it in 1 Thessalonians. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains among, upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. So, according to what Paul says, apparently this day of destruction shouldn't take us by surprise. We should be well aware that it is approaching. That is, if we are sons of light, if we are of the light. You see, according to the Messiah's words, those who are going to be swept away, like those in the days of Noah, are going to be those who are not paying attention. And so, I'll close with this. We need to pay attention. We need to be observant of all the things that are going on around us, but we don't need to pay so much attention to what's going on around us, what the adversary is doing, that we forget why God brought it to our attention in the first place. In other words, not to focus our attention on the adversary and what the adversary is doing, but to understand that what the adversary is being allowed to do is to provoke us to focus on what our Father is doing. In other words, our Father in Heaven forewarns us of what's going to happen so that we will tend to His business in our lives, and then hopefully if we do that, that's going to affect and influence those around us. So then, all these things that are happening in the world should be provocation to let Him shine in and through our lives, not for us to be enamored by what's going on in the darkness. I've said it many times, but I'm going to repeat it again, and the reason I'm going to repeat it is because God repeats it. We are here to shine. We are here to be a light. We are here to be that city set upon a hill which cannot be hidden, and hopefully awaken those who are asleep so that they will not be swept away by what is most certainly coming. Thanks for joining me once again. We'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.
Shabbat Shalom. I will release life and wholeness into your life. Let your heart be glad and rejoice in me. Let your flesh rest in hope, for I will not leave your soul in Sheol or allow you to see corruption. I will show you the path of life, and in my presence you will find fullness of joy. I will meet you with the blessings of goodness and give life and length of days to you when you ask. I will prolong your life and make your years as many generations. You will abide with me forever, for my mercy and truth will preserve you. Father, you have granted us life and favor, and your care has preserved our spirits. Life and breath are in your hands. Goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Your loving kindness is better than life, and our lips will praise you. We will bless you while we live. We will lift up our hands in your name. Amen. Recognize healing power in others. I have bestowed my gift of healing on many of my children. Be careful to recognize my power at work and show honor to those who possess my power. When my servant Elisha lived, many did not honor, respect, or received his gifts and did not receive the miracles they needed as a result. They had no faith. They did not honor my servant. My anointing for healing was available to them through Elisha, but they did not demand it from him. Yet when he lay in the tomb, a man was cast into his tomb. And when the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. Do not forget that my word and my power are in the mouth of my man. The man of God will pray for us and we will be restored. We will make room in our homes for him so that he can be refreshed. We will follow the instructions that the man of God gives us so that our flesh will be restored like that of a little child and we will be clean. We will not stretch out our hands against the man of God, for he is the Lord's anointed. Amen. Can I see that, please? I'm sorry. I'm very upset right now. Um, some of you may not know. You may not have heard the news. All right. Um, a synagogue in Pittsburgh was uh, a shooter came in and killed 12 people worshiping on the Sabbath. One reason, of course, that's a horrible thing, but the name of the synagogue is the Tree of Life. It's, our, it's the same emblem that we have, okay, out there. And I understand the message that God gave me today after I, I usually don't listen to the news, but when I turned on the car, it happened to be on. And I heard them keep talking about the Tree of Life congregation. And that's when I just kept the news on to find that out. So it looks like it was a hate hate crime because the guy rolled up into place saying all these Jews need to die. So, all right, we know it's a hate crime. You know, uh, I feel there is no accident. There are no accidents in the word of God. Okay. None whatsoever. And I am, uh, um, looking at this. Okay. All right. Looking at what she read. I didn't know what she was going to read. Okay. At all. But the warning was once again, Okay, that the person of God is going to come to you with an instruction, okay, and to listen and not come against that. God gave me a very powerful word. I want you to look out. I'm looking for Brian Randall if he comes on, okay, from Sierra Leone. Okay, uh, we may have some uh, uh, people from Sierra Leone on today, but uh, um, I may or may not, it depends upon how the spirit leads, kind of suspend normal services right now. Okay, and that today I had a vision come back to me of a picture that I saw, okay, uh, um, on the news about what's going on in Yemen. All right, and I wasn't going to bring this up, okay, wasn't going to bring it up today. Uh, oh, by the way, how is everyone? I hope everyone is having a good day. Okay, <laughs> hope you got your warm and fuzzies out of your system right now. Okay, because you know, right now, and I don't know if someone can find me. I don't know if we have it in. Oh, there it is, right there. Brad, if you could get me that sign. Okay, uh, right there that says "Prepare for War." Okay, all right. I'm gonna show this up, and you can put it in front of them. Everyone remembers this. This sign is almost 20 years old, 2001. But I'm saying this sign, I found this, okay, from 20 years ago, prepare for war. After hearing what I heard today, I heard we're at war. So I have given you 18 years to prepare for this day. You understand what I'm saying? I've given you 18 years to prepare for this day. Okay, there is no accident. We keep seeing 
okay, in the news, how people are coming against, once again, they're coming against African Americans in this country, minorities in this country, and there is always a correlation between Judah and Africa. You understand what I'm saying? Bombs going out, primarily, okay, uh, African uh, American, the things with the voting, and then we have the shooting of the Jews. There is always a correlation between Israel and Africa. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, and this time is a time for war. It is a time that we are going to be at war. We will see a lot of things okay, that are not going to be pleasant to us. And right now, this is just like that room when they were getting ready to take Osama bin Laden. You understand what I'm saying? They had all the heads of state and everything around there just watching a war room. And that's what this is. This is a war room to show us what is going on in the kingdom because we are kingdom people. We are covenant people, okay? And today you see in... Mm, in the lesson where Yahweh goes, he gets ready to walk up and say, uh-uh, I have got to tell Abraham what I'm about to do. You understand what I'm saying? I have got to tell Abraham. Who are we? We are heirs of Abraham through faith in Yeshua HaMashiach. So how can we not think that God is going to tell us what is going to happen? Okay. And the problem is, do we believe him? Okay, do we believe him or are we still, you know, disputing, you know, silly things? We still disputing in some cases what date we're going to do this on and, and stupid stuff that makes no difference in the world, according to God. This is the time in today's title when enough becomes too much. When enough becomes too much. That shooting hit me in my core for so many reasons, not just because. And now everybody on the news is talking about the Sabbath day. Oh, they are in service on the Sabbath day, the Sabbath day, the Sabbath day. What does it take for people to begin to acknowledge the Sabbath day? Does it take the blood of lambs? Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. Does it take the shedding of the blood of lambs to get people to acknowledge Yahweh's Sabbath day? You understand what I'm saying? Okay. And for him to, to kill, there are 12 dead. It's like, Lord, you are sending us a message. When are we going to get it? When I was in the shower and saw the picture of that young boy, Okay, of that young child, it just it just hurt me all over again. I'll see if I can get it and, and you know send it, you know more or less send it to you, you know. And that we have got to do something. All right, this was a child in Yemen. Those people are starving to death. They are starving because of policies that we have made are starving millions of people. And when you have babies, babies that are starving to death, that is sin. That is sin before a righteous and a holy God. And we are going to have to account for that sin. All right, we will, and we will as a nation if this nation chooses not to change it its ways. I'm going to go ahead and get started with what God gave me today. If we get a chance, we'll roll back in, okay, to the service again. I want everyone to turn to, first of all, we are going to pray. I want everyone to turn to uh, Psalm number 83. Brad, I am going to need the computer up. Uh, do I need my hater blockers? <laughs> Hopefully not. All right. I'm going to be reading ooh, from the JPS Tanakh. Psalm number 83. Okay, and like I say, when enough becomes too much, 
See, Yah says, and he constantly reminds me, you know how to pray about this. You know how to pray about the things that are going on here. When you attack one, you've attacked us all. Do you understand what I'm saying? When you go in and shoot up that synagogue on the Sabbath day and kill those who are worshiping the most high God, you have attacked us here in Tampa, Florida. When the same, the name of that congregation was Tree of Life Congregation. And that is what our logo is, the tree of life. It's Ayim, the tree of life. So, you know, it's just like God giving a sign. I'm making this personal right now. So we are going to pray and we are going to pray because let me tell you something. If you are so bold to walk into a synagogue, have no fear of God. Do you understand why I'm saying our job is to teach people how to fear the God of Israel? Because when you do not fear the God of Israel, you will come into a synagogue and shoot his people because you have no fear of retribution. Now, what is so cowardly about this all these people doing this, okay, this guy was taken, he was. He may have been wounded, but he gave himself up. So all I can say is that you have no problem killing people, but you're afraid to die yourself. Come on, you don't want to die, but you think it's okay to kill, okay? Okay to kill God's people. That means that, that there is no fear of God. And let me tell you something, that is a sin thumb, okay? Just like we talk about, homosexuality, abortion, and all of that. All of those are symptoms that we have left God. Now people have no problem with walking up into a church killing uh, people, walking into a synagogue killing people, walking into a mosque killing people. They have no fear of God. There is a spirit that is loose that does not have a fear of God. Okay, so that means if we are one, one nation under God and we no longer fear that God, trust me when I say there are going to be serious repercussions for that. We are going to pray right now because if that spirit is so, okay, so bold enough to kill Jews over here, or what is about to happen over in Israel, okay? So we are going to take a preemptive strike, okay? A preemptive strike for those that are in this country even thinking about doing some wickedness and those over in Israel also. Psalm number 83. Oh, Elohim, do not be silent. Do not hold aloof. Do not be quiet, oh, Elohim, for your enemies rage. Your foes assert themselves. They plot craftily against your people. Take counsel against your treasured ones. They say, let us wipe them out as a nation. Israel's name will be mentioned no more. Unanimous in their counsel, they have made an alliance against you. The clans of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gabel, Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre. Assyria too joins forces with them. They give support to the sons of Lot. Hello, as it was in the days of Lot. Deal with them as you did with Midian, with Sisera, with Habin, at the brook Kishon, who were destroyed at Endor, who became dung for the field. Treat their great men like Oreb and Zeb, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmunna, who said, let us take the meadows of Elohim as our possession. Oh, my Elohim, make them like thistledown, like stubble driven by the wind. As a fire burns a forest, as flames scorch the hills, pursue them with your tempest, terrify them with your, with your storm. Cover their faces with shame so that they may seek your name, O Yahweh. May they be frustrated and terrified, disgraced and doomed forever. May they know that your name, yours alone, is Yahweh, supreme over all the earth. Psalm 109. Psalm 109. Hallelujah. O oh, Elohim of my praise, do not keep aloof for the wicked and the deceitful. Open their mouth against me. They speak to me with lying tongues. They encircle me with words of hate 
They attack me without cause. They answer my love with accusation and I must stand judgment. They repay me with evil for good, with hatred for my love. Appoint a wicked man over him. May an accuser stand at his right side. May he be tried and convicted. May he be judged and found guilty. May his days be few. May another take over his position. May his children be orphans, his wife a widow. May his children wander from their hovels, begging in search of bread. May his creditors seize all his possessions. May strangers plunder his wealth. May no one show him mercy. May none pity his orphans. May his posterity be cut off. May their names be blotted out in the next generation. May Elohim be ever mindful of his father's iniquity. May the sin of his mother not be blotted out. May Yahweh be aware of them always and cause their names to be cut off from the earth because he was not minded to act kindly and hounded to death poor and needy man, one crushed in spirit. He loved to curse, may a curse come upon him. He would not bless, may blessing be far from him. May he be clothed in a curse like a garment. May it enter his body like water, his bones like oil. Let it be like the cloak he wraps around him, like the belt he always wears. May Yahweh thus repay my accusers, all those who speak evil against me. Now you, O Elohim, my Adonai, act on my behalf as it befits your name. Good and faithful as you are, save me. For I am poor and needy, and my heart is pierced within me. I fade away like the lengthening shadow. I am shaken off like locusts. My knees give away from fasting. My flesh is lean, has lost its fat. I am the object of their scorn. When they see me, they shake their head. Help me, O Yahweh, my Elohim. Save me in accord with your faithfulness, that men may know that it is your hand, that you, O Yahweh, have done it. Let them curse, but you bless. Let them rise up, but come to grief. While your servant rejoices, my accusers shall be clothed in shame, wrapped in their disgrace as in a robe. My mouth shall sing much praise to Yahweh. I will acclaim him in the midst of a throng because he stands at the right hand of the needy to save him from those who would condemn him. Go back for a moment. Okay, to verse number nine, nine and 10. Okay, where it says, may his children be orphans, his wife a widow. May his children wander under their hovels and begging in search of bread. Where do you recognize that as a consequence of a particular action? Anybody recognize that specific? Okay, con as a consequence of a particular action, turn to Exodus chapter 22. Exodus 22. Verse number 20, you shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall not ill-treat any widow or orphan. If you do mistreat them, I will heave their outcry as soon as they cry out to me, and my anger shall blaze forth, and I will put you to the sword, and your own wives shall become widows and your children offering orphans. Okay, then he goes on to talk about creditors and all of that. You understand what I'm saying? In that Psalm is an exact consequence of an action that has been taken. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, we are seeing certain things right now, okay, which gives explanation as to why, okay, the message that I got today, and it all ties in, okay, to as it was in the days of Lot. Okay, uh, let's go to 
We're going to go to Daniel 4, but my day started out today at Isaiah 46, 10, where he says he is declaring the end from the beginning. I heard the end from the beginning and also the end of the matter were the two terms, okay, that I heard. When I hear a term like that, I immediately go to the Blue Letter Bible, okay, Blue Letter Bible, and look up those particular terms. So in Isaiah 46, 10, it is declaring the end from the beginning. So guess what? If you are in the beginning, you are reading about how it is going to be in the end. Okay, how it is going to be in the end. That's why as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, where are the, the uh, um, professions or rather the stories of Lot and Noah found in the beginning. You understand what I'm saying? So if you understand the beginning, you know how God is going to act in the end. And when we are reading this uh, year's Torah portion, especially in Genesis, I want you to keep in mind that you are not going back to the beginning you are looking at the beginning as how it is going to be in the end times, okay? If you read it from that aspect, you will see certain things that are going on and things that will happen, okay? We know that, okay, Genesis begins with creation. It ends with Israel being in Egypt, but always remember, Egypt was a place, wound up being a place for Israel that promoted their prosperity. It was a refuge for them. It was kind of like a restoration back to the Garden of Eden. By the time that Genesis ends, the people of God are the wealthy ones, okay? Always remember that, okay? So he reveals the end from the beginning. That is why it is so important that we pay attention to everything that is going on in Genesis. Okay, because he is showing us this is what I am going to do in these end of days. Okay, in Daniel chapter four, I want you to put, and I'm, I'm going to read from the uh, uh, JPS to not. All right. Put today's date on it. This was a message two and a message four a message two and a message four this can be a message to a person it can be a message to a nation a message two or a message four it could be a person or it could be a nation okay this was given to me at 9.46 a.m. Daniel chapter 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living serenely in my house, flourishing in my palace. I had a dream that frightened me, and my thoughts in bed and the vision of my mind alarmed me. I gave an order to bring all the wise men of Babylon before me to let me know the meaning of the dream. The magicians, exorcists, Chaldeans, and diviners came, and I related the dream to them, but they could not make its meaning known to me. Finally, Daniel called Belteshazzar after the name of my God. You see how the first thing he did was change the name from the Most High to the name of his God. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. That's what they always do, all right? In whom the spirit of the holy gods was, was came to me. Now, you also see what he did here. Instead of the spirit of the most high God, he lumps Yahweh with all the other gods. You understand what I'm saying? So when people do not have a respect for your God, okay, they will think your God is like all the other gods of the world. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar, okay, like 
Pharaoh in some aspects thought he was a god because remember what they would do when they captured any land they would capture once again he had taken the temple so since he had burned down the temple don't you think he's thinking that he is more powerful than the god of Israel and that's the what they would say if you remember in Isaiah how Sennacherib came and said if you think Yahweh is going to serve you, I got a whole bunch, a, a room full of bobblehead dolls from other gods, from other nations, you see. So when people lose fear of your God, of the God who you say you are watching, who watches over your nation, they will attack you as a nation. Hello. If people lose fear, of the God that you say watches over you, he will attack your God because they no longer fear that your nation. You understand what I'm saying? If you don't understand, we are one nation under God. Why do other nations feel that they can come and attack us? You better think about it. Anybody got a copy of that, uh, 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 Roberta Franklin? You uh, not, Roberta, not Roberta, Aretha Franklin. You better think about what you're trying to do, okay? Because understand, we've had other nations come in here and attack us. If you don't believe that, Remember when they get ready to go over to the promised land and Joshua sends the spies. And the first thing they hear, we are terrified of you. We have seen what your God did to the other nations. So we were afraid to attack. So when people lose fear of the God that you say watches over you, they will have no fear of attacking you okay you understand what i'm saying all right so we are looking for all in some cases all the wrong signs of being under a judgment we are looking for the physical we're not thinking about how nations are attacking us through the internet and through things like that so internet is air airplanes physical Okay, you understand when we talked about in the in the revelation study how on heavens and in earth two realms that you can see you have your feet on the earth you can look in the heavens and see the sun the moon the stars and all of creation so two realms that you can see when the enemy attacks you trust me when I say you will be able to see it but will you discern properly discern the sign okay of the if the nation is under attack as a whole now understand any nation knows that if you are a nation you have an army right so if a nation attacks you they're really saying i'm not afraid of your army you understand what i'm saying Okay, so when, if your nation is under physical attack, remember it begins where? In the realm of the spirit. So we are, we have enemies that are no longer afraid of America and recognize that America can no longer be the protector of the world therefore they have no fear of attacking us now understand something once the veil is off you not only have problems from outside attackers but what else those that are inside already when your immune system is down in your body those things already on the inside will begin to attack 
like you. However, you are also more susceptible to those things from that come at you from the outside. Like if there's flu on the outside. If your immune system is down, you will catch it. However, cancers and things are already on the inside. So if your immune system is down, you could get a two-way attack. That from within, that from without, which further do what? Attack your immune system and weaken it to the point where your body can no longer fight. You see, God gives us a physical example that we can understand of things that are going on. Why are we seeing plagues like measles come back? And an article came up that, oh, hello, measles outbreak is coming from those who have been vaccinated. Come on. You see, flu outbreaks from those who have been vaccinated with the flu. You understand what I'm saying? We, people want a sign but you do not know the sign of the times. Okay, recognize the sign of the times. Okay, so here we have Nebuchadnezzar, all right? He has a dream, sounds familiar, right? He had a dream before, Pharaoh had a dream, okay? Whenever these pagan leaders have a dream, who does Yah use to interpret their dreams? His people you understand what i'm saying the whole purpose of you once again being brought into the torah and we went over this if you get a chance leroy please listen to thursday's service because our whole purpose of creation okay from genesis is to serve god our whole purpose being brought into the torah okay is to be able to serve him as his priest and to take that out to the nations. You see, so you have a double portion, not only just being called to serve God, but as a priest, you're being called to be in, he calls one nation into that priesthood, okay? And then within that nation, there is a priesthood. You understand what I'm saying? So it is like a wheel within a wheel for what our purpose is. We are being brought into the knowledge of the Torah. Now understand, we came into the Torah with the Holy Spirit, with the spirit of truth that is leading us and guiding us into all truth. And what does he give us every single Torah cycle? More truth and more truth and reveal it to us how this thing we are supposed to walk this thing out. So whenever there is a pagan leader in charge and that leader needs direction, they can never get true direction from anyone who has not been Torah obedient. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So finally, Daniel called Belteshazzar after the name of my God in whom the spirit of the holy gods was came to me and I related the dream to him saying, Belteshazzar, chief magician in whom I know the spirit of the holy gods to be. Now see, they may not respect your God above all the other gods, but they have the ability to recognize the working of that God in you. Okay, but let me say something. This said he had called all of his magicians, exorcists, Chaldeans, all those other gods. So what is he really saying here? He's saying, I know the God you serve is more powerful than any of the other gods represented here. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, remember, this is why we are called into the kingdom, all right? So he goes on to say, in whom no mystery baffles, tell me the meaning of my dream vision that I have seen. In the visions of my mind and bed, I saw a tree. Now, always rep remember, whenever you see a leader mention of the nation, that leader represents the entire nation as a whole. You understand what I'm saying? So the message can be for an individual, 
the message can be for a nation, okay, also. So we're having a dual purpose here. I saw a tree of great height in the midst of the earth. The tree grew and became mighty. Its top reached the heavens and it was visible to the ends of the earth. So this was a nation that started out small, and became a world leader so that everyone saw, every nation around it saw its greatness. Oh, that sounds familiar. Okay. Its foliage was beautiful. Its fruit abundant. There was food for all in it. Hello. That means people recognize this nation as a land of prosperity would come to this nation for food and sustenance. Hello. Beneath it, the beast of the field found shade and the birds of the sky dwelt on its branches. All creatures fed on it. You understand? Beast and fowl can also be other nations, both good and both bad, okay? In the vision of my mind in bed, I looked and saw a holy watcher coming down from heaven. Ruh -roh. <laughs> he called loudly and said, hew the tree down, top off its branches, strip off its foliage, scatter its fruit. Hello. Let the beast of the field flee from beneath it and the birds from its branches. Okay, so something is going to happen to this nation during the time frame of this person that is going to cause this nation no longer to be capable of feeding the beasts, the fowls, and all of this. It will be publicly done. Okay, you understand what I'm saying with this? Better understand what I'm saying with this. And guess where the directive is coming from? From God, yes. From God. Don't mix up this is all about God with it meaning it's God's approval for good. You understand what I'm saying? It can be all about God and it is all about God. But let me tell you something. As heirs of Abraham through faith in Yeshua, I fully believe that when we pray and we ask God to show us and we ask God for a reason why, he's going to show it to us. Okay? So it goes on. Now, here's the word of hope. And this is the only word of hope that I can see but leave the stump with its roots in the ground. Why? So it can, it may go through a period of downfall, but it will always have the capability of restoration. If God had plucked it up from the roots, there would be no chance of restoration, but he simply cuts down that, particular tree leaving the stump to recover eventually so that's the word of hope in fetters of iron and bronze in the grass of the field let him be drenched with dew of heavens and share earth's verdue with the beast let his mind be altered from that of a man now remember Nebuchadnezzar is in charge. This is something that happens during Nebuchadnezzar's reign. See la on that. Let his mind be altered from that of a man and let him be given the mind of a beast and let seven seasons pass over him. Seven seasons, that's seven years. Seven years from the time that he gets the vision. We'll see this. Okay. Um, this sentence is what? Decreed by the watchers. 
This verdict is commanded by the holy ones so that all creatures may know that the most high is sovereign over the realm of man and he gives it to whom he wishes and he may set over it even the lowest of men. I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have this dream. Now you, Belteshazzar, tell me its meaning, since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make its meaning known to me, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Daniel called Belteshazzar. See, God called him Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar called him Belteshazzar. Was perplexed for a while, and alarmed by his thoughts. The king addressed him, let the dream and its meaning not alarm you. Belteshazzar replied, my Lord, would that the dream were for your enemy and its meaning for your foe. So in other words, the meaning of this dream okay, is going to strengthen your enemies about what is going to happen to you personally and to the nation that you are over. The tree that you saw grow and become mighty, whose top reached heaven, which was visible throughout the earth, whose foliage was beautiful, whose fruit was so abundant that there was food for all in it, beneath which the beast of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the sky lodged, it is you. Now, remember, birds and fowl and beasts can mean outside nations, but they also can mean wicked spirits. So you have the capability of both, okay? It is you, O king, who have grown and become mighty, whose greatness has grown to reach heaven and whose dominion is to the end of the earth. The holy watcher to whom the king saw descend from heaven and say, hew down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump with its roots in the ground, in fetters of iron and bronze, in the grass of the field, let him be drenched with dew of heaven and share the lot of the beast of the field until seven seasons pass over him. Now, let me say something. You need to also, this is why we study the Bible also historically as well as biblically as well as culturally. And I'll get into this after this. Until seven seasons pass over him. So that's a seven year season. This is its meaning, O king. It is the decree of the most high, which has overtaken my Lord, the king. Now, was Nebuchadnezzar in the height of his ruling? Was the nation at the height of its prosperity? Yes. You will be driven away from men and have your habitation with the beast of the field. You will be fed grass like cattle and become drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven seasons will pass over you until you come to know that the Most High is sovereign over the realm of man and he gives it to whom he wishes. Okay, he gives it to whom he wishes, not whom you wish. You understand what I'm saying? And the meaning of the command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots is that the kingdom will remain yours from the time you come to know that heaven is sovereign. Therefore, O king, may my advice be acceptable to you. Redeem your sins by beneficence and your iniquities by what? Generosity to whom? To the poor. Then your so serenity may be extended. So in other words, King, if you 
<clears throat> do not want this to happen, you need to repent and extend your hand to the poor. So, all this befell King Nebuchadnezzar 12 months later. So what are we talking about? A period of, a total of one plus seven is what? Eight years, which is what? It's a cycle, political cycle. Okay? 12 months later, as he was walking on the roof. So this thing doesn't begin to happen until the second year. They're within the second year. He was walking on the roof of the royal palace at Babylon. The king exclaimed, oh, man, there is Baba, great Babylon. There is, I have made Babylon great. Which I have built with my vast power to be a royal resident for the glory of my majesty. Oh, Lord, have mercy. The words were still on the king's lip when a voice fell from heaven. It has been decreed for you, O King Nebuchadnezzar. The kingdom has passed out of your hands. You are being driven away from men and your habitation is to be with the beast of the field. You are to be fed grass like cattle and seven seasons will pass over you until you come to your senses. Come to know that the most high is sovereign over the realm of the man and he gives it to whom he wishes. Remember, the message is not only for a person, it is for a nation. Okay, now what you need to understand about this is that, hold on here, all right? Verse 30, there and then the sentence was carried out upon Nebuchadnezzar. So from his second year on, you see, he don't have his right mind. But he's still in rulership over the nation. But the nation is actually being ruled by his consultants. <laughs> Drop the mic. Let's see. Okay. He was driven away from men. He ate grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like eagle's feathers. You know, like eagles, beggars flopping all over the wind and all that. And his nails like the talons of birds. In other words, he looks just as crazy as he is. When the time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason was restored to me. Remember, person represents the nation. Person also represents the nation. So let me ask you something. What are we going to have to go through before we decide to lift up our eyes as a nation and recognize who the Most High God is. In other words, what I'm seeing with this is that we're going to have to go through something for a seven-year period. Oh, my God, help us. Oh, my God, help us. Unless what? Repentance is the only thing that is going to change this thing around. All right? He goes on. I lift my eyes to heaven and my reason was restored to me and I blessed the most high and praised and glorified the everlasting one. Hello. He wasn't a believer. I bet you he is now. We didn't believe that what God said, he really meant. What is going to have to happen that we lift up our eyes and say, you alone are God. All of this happened at the height of their prosperity. Mm. Important for you to study what also happened historically.
Because during those seven years, what a lot of people don't know is that Nebuchadnezzar was was also very friendly with the Medes and the Persians. You understand what I'm saying? During that seven years, it acts of him not being himself. It actually strengthened the hands of the nations that would eventually attack and overtake Babylon. They were friends. Okay, but I put that in quotes. They were, let's put it this way. They were friendly towards one another. But when the one recognized the weakness in the other, Daniel was so grieved because he says, this message is a message for your enemies. You understand? Okay. And then he goes on, okay, uh, um, to give praise finally, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and whose kingdom endures throughout the generations. All the inhabitants of the earth are of no account. He does as he wishes with the host of heaven and with the inhabitants of the earth. There is none to stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? There and then, my reason was restored to me and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom. What did God say in second Chronicles chapter seven? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin and do what? heal their land. Do you see the formula here? Okay, you see the formula right here. Okay, my companions and nobles sought me out and I was reestablished over my kingdom and added greatness was given me. So now I, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar represents not just a person, but it represents the nation as a whole because in the Bible, the leader of the nation represents the nation. So that's why it's important for you to study the Bible historically, because when God mentions the leader, he's telling you how he's going to deal with the nation as a whole. Okay. Shall exalt and glorify the king of heaven, all of whose work are just and whose ways are right, who is able to humble those who behave arrogantly. Okay. All right. So this, I could rename this, uh, uh, make Babylon great again. <laughs> okay. okay. Make Babylon great again. Okay. In fact, that's a good title. We're changing titles. Make Babylon great again. Okay. Maybe just keep both of them. Uh, look at his nose. Okay. When enough is too much. Okay. We'll leave it there. Okay. Subtitle make Babylon great again. Okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So we see right here. Okay. This is a message to a nation. It is a message to the nation. All right. It is a reason why. When you wonder how things are ordained by God, God ordains prosperity. But in the midst of prosperity, he also ordains judgment. Because what happens during the prosperity, people get arrogant. And they think it's all about them and not about God. So God there appeals to the idols within their heart to do what? Eventually bring them down. You understand what I'm saying? So understand when you see certain things, the reason why. Do not become dismayed because it will be a period of time, whether it is a period of time for four years or whether it is a period of time for a total of eight years. It depends upon repentance. You understand what I'm saying? It depends upon repentance of the land. Where there is no repentance, you go the full cycle, all right? But know what he says after that, that's cut down, it's dead. There's gonna be a stump left that will restore itself. 
So you always end with a good message of restoration. Of course, during the seven years, let me tell you, things were rough for the nation. Its leader was crazy and everybody knew it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> everybody knew it. And guess what? You don't see them attack them then because it wasn't decreed by God. It was decreed by God to be an example. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, he had to bring that nation completely down in the eyes of everyone. However, that weakness and that weak period within the nation caused other nations to lose respect for that nation, eventually strengthened them to be able to attack that nation and overcome it and be over it. Okay, so we see during the seven year period that while Nebuchadnezzar was the king, he was not the ruler. There were others in his place that were actually calling all the shots. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, whatever shots they call called actually weakened the nation. We see in chapter five, King Belshazzar, okay, which is, I think he is like a grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. All right. He's not in charge, but this is why it's important for you to study historically, okay, also Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar. All right, and I have one more term. Hold on a minute here. Let me get it for you. Oh, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. Okay, what's going on there? All right, and... Uh, um. He has a banquet. This is after Nebuchadnezzar has died. Now, understand something. Daniel had to be an extremely young man because this happens 25 years after the death of Nebuchadnezzar. And we see who? Daniel again. Chapter five, and here we get the meeny, meeny, tickle, oof, farce in your kingdom. God has number. Listen, chapter five, verse number 25. This is the writing that is inscribed, mene, mene, tickle, oof, farce in. And this is its meaning, mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Okay, mene, mene is what? Two times. Double witness. God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tico, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Balance, the balances are a sign of what? Justice. Justice. You've been weighed in the balance. Your kingdom, your administration, your kingdom has been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Paris, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Okay, now remember, Daniel, he made Daniel, if he could bring, okay, the uh, um, proper interpretation of that writing, he would make him third of the kingdom. You understand? Why third of the kingdom? Because he would be under him. There was one in charge above him. Belteshazzar, or rather, ruled a dual ruling with another ruler at that time. That's why you study it historically to know what's going on. Daniel is still around. This is 25 years after the death of Nebuchadnezzar. So he's an old man because chapter six then occurs the same night that chapter five was written in and we see Darius the Mede, okay, come in. All right, we go Daniel and the, what, lion's den and all of that. And then Daniel's dreams and everything are given to him. We later see Cyrus, okay, in the book of Isaiah. So Darius and Cyrus, okay, once again, the end of Daniel is when? or rather end of Daniel starting in chapter nine. Remember, he's wondering about the 70 year prophecy. At that particular point, 
okay? We know, okay, that the 70 years is about up. Who becomes in charge at the end of that 70 years? We see Cyrus coming in charge, and he is the one to do what? Release the people back into the land. So by the time we see this, we know Daniel is a very old man. Daniel has been given, okay, prophecy that goes all the way until the end of time. So he reveals the end in the book of Daniel. Daniel meaning God is my judge. God is my judge. So if you want to know how he is also going to deal with the people of God in the end times, Daniel is an excellent book. Revelation is the fulfillment of that book. In Daniel, the book is closed, closed and sealed. In Revelation, the book is unsealed and opened. Okay, we get that? All right, so it's important to read, okay, Daniel, okay, once again, because he gives a prophecy for the end of days. Now, here's something that a lot of people don't know. Not all of Daniel's prophecy came to pass exactly the way it was written. There were some parts, okay, regarding a king who dies and all of this kind of stuff, you know, in chapter 11 and all of that, that did not come to pass exactly as it was written. Like half of the sentence did, the other half didn't. Now, to me, what that says is that we've yet to experience that. See, people get linear and they stop, well, we see this, but this didn't happen, so we're going to throw that out. No. Always remember the pattern of prophecy can talk about something that goes on in the near future. Now, you don't consider something happening 300 or 600 years later near, but it is. Because a day with the Lord is what? As a thousand years. So it's less than in half a day. In other words, this thing takes place if we're going on God's time. So therefore, what you have to consider is the fact that if it didn't all happen exactly that way that time when the cycle comes around again we know what to look for based upon what happened in the first part which is what yeshua says as it was in the book of daniel they that have an ear here we know that yeshua talked about something that also was going to happen in the near future but would also happen in the far future. So that is why probably on a revelation study, we're going to go through this so that I can thoroughly explain to you what those nations are and all of that so that we study the book of Daniel historically also. Okay, so, you know, we know Daniel and the message in Daniel 4 was a message given to a pagan king where? Outside of Israel. Daniel is written outside of Israel about a nation that is in what strategic alliance. They're over Israel. Think of it like this. Babylon is the military power over Israel. So their connection with the military, okay, once again, they are a power over them that supports them militarily. Okay, so the message was given to a pagan king outside of Israel. Okay, Babylon is connected to Israel, but not Israel. Babylon is a nation that is militarily superior to Israel. Hello. Okay, so, so many people are so quick in the book of uh, Revelation to call United States Babylon. You understand what I'm saying? You better know when you're talking about Babylon, if we are Babylon, then this message is to who? It's to us. Okay, it is to us. And that's the good news. Okay. All right. Um, let's go to, now we can go to our Torah portion. All right. Or is that enough? Are you kind of, uh, are you kind of blown out? Because we can't end it. 
Okay. We can end it, okay, uh, right there, unless we want to do a little bit about Sodom and Gomorrah and the end of days, because it is all tied together. Uh, Ed just said, ring her out dry. <laughs> okay, ring her out dry. All right, let's go to our Torah portion, Genesis chapter 18. All right, pretty much be reading. Okay. Genesis chapter 18, all right, is said to more or less take place about three days after Genesis chapter 17 and the circumcision. All right. Verse one. Yahweh appeared to him by the terebinths of Mamre. He was sitting at the entrance of the tent as the day grew hot. Looking up, he saw three men standing near him. As soon as he saw them, he ran from the entrance of the tent to greet them. And bowing to the ground, he said, My lords, if it please you, do not go on past your servant. Let a little water be brought bathe your feet, recline under the tree. What did he do? He offered what? Hospitality to strangers coming in to his midst. And let me fetch a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves. How did he treat them? With dignity. Then go seeing that you have come your servant's way. They replied, do as you have said. So Abraham hastened to the tent of Sarah and said, okay, he hastened to the tent of Sarah. It's very clear to hear this is Sarah's tent and not his tent. Okay. And said, quick, three sias of choice flour, knead and make cakes. Then Abraham ran to the herd took a calf tender and choice, gave it to a servant boy who hastened to prepare it. He took what? Curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set them before, set before them and waited on the, under the tree as they did what? They ate. Hello. And what did they eat? Meat and milk. Okay, meat and milk. Uh-huh. All right, so we get that understanding. Yeah, right, right. Okay, now another thing to, you know, understand. This is Abraham. We're heirs of Abraham, right? He sees the physical God in the physical. All right? They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he replied, there in the tent. Then one said, I will return to you next year. And your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. So a year. A year from now, Sarah to have a son. Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old. The Bible makes they were old, advanced in years. Sarah had stopped having the periods of women. You know, that's a lot of information, personal information, okay? But God wants to make a point with this. Okay, you need to make a point in your life with this also. God is not looking at the length of time. Just when you think things are over and incapable of happening is where God begins. You understand? Sometimes I, I feel God has to take you to the, are you talking to yourself? Sometimes God has to take you to the point where you can see no hope of anything ever happening. And that's where he begins. And Sarah laughed to herself, saying, 
now that I am withered, <laughs> am I to have enjoyment with my husband so old? Okay, I can picture her laughing, thinking about that. You see the bubble above her head? Oh, really? Oh my God, okay. Then Yahweh, uh-oh, now it's not the one who said. Now Yahweh said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, I shall I in truth bear a child old as I am? Let me tell you something. What does that tell you? God not only knows where you are, what your condition is, but he can hear what you're thinking. He knows what's in your heart. Okay? So you don't have to say it in other words. He knows what's in your heart. Now, another thing. He knows what you are thinking about what he said about you. He knows what you are thinking about the instruction he has given you. Had God given Abraham and Sarah an instruction at this point? Yes, what was the instruction? You go, hey, come on now, make a baby. Uh, what is this? Okay, Sarah and Abraham in the tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G. Okay. First comes love, then comes marriage. Here comes Sarah with the baby carrot. Okay. <laughs> All right. That that's in the the gospel according to Charlotte Israel version, okay? Oh my god, I love this. Is anything too wondrous for Yahweh? Is anything. See, Yahweh will make you laugh and joy. You understand what I'm saying? I will I will my will is to return to you at the same season next year and Sarah shall have a son. Sarah lied saying, I did not laugh. Now look, the jig is up, it's over, okay? For she was frightened. Hello? That's you. God says something and you immediately, you get frightened, you have excuse. Then you lie, oh yeah, I'm full of faith. No, you aren't, God already saw you lie. You lying, okay? But he replied, you did laugh. Okay, so who are you lying to? Yourself. <laughs> the only one you are lying to is yourself. Okay, so therefore, the only one who can stop you is you. Okay. The men set out from there and looked down towards Sodom. Abraham walking with them to see them off. All right. This part isn't in the Bible, but it will be in my version. Then Sarah got on the internet to Victoria's Secrets and overnighted a negligee. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yes. Oh, you got it. All right. All right. And Yahweh said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? since Abraham is to become a great and populous nation and all the nations of the earth are to bless themselves by him. For I have singled him out that he may instruct his children and his posterity to keep the way of Yahweh by doing what is just and right in order that Yahweh may bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Oh my God, we are heirs of Abraham through faith in Yeshua. This is not Abraham's promise alone. It is your promise. It is your children's promise. You need to highlight that and put this is my promise spoken out of the mouth of God during when? The days of Lot. Come on during the days of Lot, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, show it, so it shall be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Come on. 
Then Yahweh said, the outrage of Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is their sin so grave. I will go down to see whether they have acted together according to the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will take note. So there were three that came, right? What is the biblical principle? Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. But he says, I myself will go see. So what I see with here is that Yahweh does not judge a nation or execute judgment upon a nation until he himself has witnessed that judgment. He sends two representatives because there need to be two witnesses. You understand what I'm saying? Need to be two witnesses, all right? Now, let me say something. Heaven and earth are witnesses, right? But he sent two witnesses that people could see. In other words, you will see them coming. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, these were physical witnesses, not just the heavens and the earth. These were physical witnesses. Now, we do know that Sodom historically was a great shedder of blood, okay? So the blood did what? The blood shed on the earth did what? Cried out into the heavens. Blood has a voice. The blood shed of innocence has a voice. When I say the blood shed of innocence, what am I talking about? Huh? What am I talking about? Wrongful death. If I'm saying in America, the bloodshed of innocence, what am I talking about? And what else? You were right. We immediately, our mind goes to what? Abortion. Our mind doesn't go to what happened with the Native Americans. Our mind doesn't go to what happened with the slaves. Our mind only goes to what happened in 1973. Our mind doesn't go to Grim Jim Crow, Ku Klux Klan, and hanging people on trees. Our mind only goes to this. But the blood cries out and the outcry is great. And why am I so fearful for this country? Because as it was in the days of Lot, God is going to send physical representatives to see and experience what is going on in a country. They will not only see it, they will be made to experience it for themselves. One caravan I can see sending another one is a witness. How are you going to deal with it? I'm giving you a second chance. Instead, we see things going backwards. We see people killing people because of their color. Oh, we got the Jews, but this week also, we had a man walk up and kill blacks, and he was headed towards the church, but the church door was locked. So he goes and kills two black people. And then the same week, a couple days later, he goes in and kills Jews. You understand what I'm saying? And all of this is being witnessed by who? Everybody in the world. So that God is giving everyone a reason why when he begins to deal with us the way that he is. The way he dealt 
with Nebuchadnezzar. You understand what I'm saying? Very sobering word. It's a sobering word, but always remember judgment upon the execution of a judgment upon a nation results in deliverance for his people within that nation. You understand what I'm saying? The word of hope is always, even though the tree may be cut down, the stump is still there. What does the stump represent? The remnant. Isaiah chapter 6. He says, all of this stuff is going to happen, but there is going to be a remnant, and you're going to like what you see from that remnant. You understand what I'm saying? You can always take comfort that there will be a remnant. You want to know also how you can take even greater comfort? Be that remnant. You understand what I'm saying? Be the remnant that he is talking about here. All right? We see Abraham get into negotiations. Okay? Let's go verse 22. The men went out from there to Sodom while Abraham remained standing before Yahweh. Abraham came forward and said, will you sweep away the innocent along with the guilty? Hey, God, are you going to deal with these innocent people the same way you're dealing with the guilty? Hello, are you heirs of Abraham? Why aren't you praying this? Shouldn't we be praying this for right now? What if there should be 50 innocent within the city? What if there be one innocent within one each state? Will you then wipe out the place and not forgive it for the sake of the innocent 50 who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing to bring death upon the innocent as well as the guilty so that the innocent and the guilty fare alike. Okay, it's important for you to understand what he is saying. He goes, far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly. So while we are going through stuff, well, maybe it's because we haven't been praying the right thing. You understand what I'm saying? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right, I think it says in King James. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly. And Yahweh answered and said, if I find within the city of Sodom 50 innocent ones, I will forgive the whole place for their sake, the power of one. The power of one. What did he command us to do? Pray for our cities where he has put us. You understand what I'm saying? The power of one, the power of what you can do within your city, your neighborhood, your city, your county, your state, your nation. Okay, you understand? The subcontinent, all right? Abraham spoke up to saying, here I venture to speak, my Lord. I who am but dust and ashes. What if the 50 innocent should lack five? Will you destroy the whole city for want of five? And he answered, I will not destroy if I find 45 there. But he spoke to him again and said, what if 40 should be found there? Now, understand something. Abraham fully knew who he was talking to. He fully knew who he was making that request to. When you pray, who are you making your request to? Are you sure? Because if you are certain, he could pray that prayer because he understood the nature of the one who he was praying to or making his request known. You understand what I'm saying? And he answered, I will not do it for the sake of the 40. And he said, let not my Lord be answered. Uh, be angry if I go on. What if 30 should be found there? And he answered, I will not do it <clears throat> if I find 30 there. And he said, I venture again to speak to my Lord. And that Lord is Adonai. What if 20 should be found? He answered, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. And he said, let not my Lord be angry if I speak but this last time. What if 10 should be found there? And he answered, I will not destroy it for the sake of the 10. Okay. When Yahweh had finished speaking to Abraham, he departed and Abraham returned to his place. 
We now know that the two angels arrived in Sodom when? In the evening. We know that Lot prepares for them what? A calf and unleavened bread. Hello, Passover. But what does this tell you? We see the death angel doing what? The same exact thing in Sodom and Gomorrah during that time as we see in Egypt hundreds of years later, okay? All right, so that is a cyclical thing. So we know just as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, just as it, or rather Lot, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Now, we know in our, what was it? This week in biblical history? Okay, what did we see? All right, great flood begins. All right, Heshvan 17, okay, uh, um, and that is one account, okay, of, you know, of that when the flood begins, all right. So we have fall feast, we have spring feast. Fall and spring being times of judgment. Okay, with that. Going over a little bit with Sodom. Okay, right now. I'm, I'm reading from an article that I have. Sodom and Gomorrah were cities mentioned in the book of Genesis. Throughout the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, and the Deuterocanonical canonical books, as well as the Quran and the Hadith. According to the Torah, the kingdoms of Sodom and Gomorrah were allied with the cities of Adma, Zeboim, and Bela. All right, now, understand something. In this, we see he was not only going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, but those five cities, right? So he was not only going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, but their allies that were in agreement with them. Hello. All right. These five cities, also known as the cities of the plain. Cities of the plain. They were situated on the Jordan River Plain in the southern region of the land of Canaan. The plain, which corresponds to the area just north of the modern day Dead Sea, was compared to the Garden of Eden as being well watered and green, suitable for grazing livestock. That is why Lot went there, remember? Okay. Divine judgment by God was passed upon Sodom and Gomorrah and two neighboring cities, which were completely consumed by fire and brimstone. Neighboring Zoar or Bella was the only city to be spared. And that was because Lot did what? He asked. You understand? Lot in his total unrighteousness at least was able to affect one. Okay, one city. All right. Okay, in Abrahamic religions, Sodom and Gomorrah have become synonymous with impenitent sin. In other words, you're not repenting. I know what I'm doing is wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. Impenitent sin and their fall with a proverbial manifestation of divine retribution. Sodom and Gomorrah have been used historically and today as metaphors for vice and homosexuality, although a close reading of the text and other ancient Near East sources suggest that this association may be incorrect. So just because you say that's what it is doesn't mean that's what God says it is and doesn't mean that that's why he passed judgment on those cities because of that. Remember, those things they were doing were signs of a nation that did not fear the God of the heavens and the earth. Remember, when you lose your fear of the God of your land, you will do things that are uh, offensive to that God. When you lose your fear 
of the God of the land, you will break his commandments. Come on, you will break those commandments, all right? The story has therefore given rise to words in several languages. These include the word sodomy, which is used in sodomy laws to describe sexual crimes against nature, namely anal or oral sex, okay, or bestiality. Some Islamic societies incorporate punishments associated with so Sodom and Gomorrah into Sharia law. So Sharia law is not just about women wearing all of that. It's about things that are contained in the Torah, all right? They combine that. Woman, okay, going out in her father's house, playing the harlot, the Bible says is very clear. So they do it. You get mad at them, okay? These things that are in the Old Testament, because we know that Old Testament God was real cruel, are the things that are also into Sharia law. Am I promoting Sharia law? No, I am not. Don't even, don't even go there with me. Okay. However, do not get mad at them because they take the law of their God seriously and we pass laws that are contrary to what the God who we say we are under passes. Okay, evangelical church. Reversing Roe versus Wade ain't going to do nothing. Women were performing abortions long before Roe versus Wade. So it is not going to stop abortions. If you have that in your mind, you better get out of it. Only thing that Roe versus Wade did was make abortions legal so that women could go into a safe place to have them, okay? Abortions are wrong, but also remember, they were having abortions before Roe versus Wade. Abortions are wrong. Oh, they were having abortions back here in the Bible. You understand what I'm saying? So God did not pass judgment upon the nations having abortions because of abortion. He passed judgment upon them because that abortion was a sign, a physical sign that you no longer respected his law. You understand what I'm saying? There's a difference. You don't go, let me ask you something. How many of you here have, have are currently having a diagnosis of cancer? No one here, right? So are you going to ask the doctor to go and give you chemotherapy? No, you aren't. Because you only do that if there is what? A physical sign. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, with that. So once again, the sign, don't put the law, okay, as an excuse, okay? If the church has not changed the hearts of the people, you will not be able to affect the actions of the people. Homosexuality is as old as the Bible itself. Am I promoting that? No, I am not. Am I promoting marriage between same sex? No, I am not. But it is as old as the Bible itself. If God were going to pass judgment on every nation that that happened because purely for that one reason, we would have a very short Bible to read. We would have never become a nation. We would have been destroyed long before then because this has been going on since Bible times. You understand what I'm saying? So don't get all your panties in a wad about some of these laws and, oh, we're finally going to get these laws. <laughs> okay, <laughs> reverse. Okay, that's not going to stop what's about to happen. You understand what I'm saying? It's not going to stop. That has already been passed. We are already past the point of no return unless we as a nation fall on our face and confess our sin. We confess the sin of homosexuality and the homosexuality and abortion, but we're okay with racism. It's still murder. 
You still aren't sorry if you're okay with racism. You still are not sorry because of what happened with Jim Crow. You still are not sorry with what happened with the Native Americans. You still aren't sorry. Don't fool yourself because you're not fooling God. You understand what I'm saying? So there must be national repentance and acknowledgement of sin. The good news is that Yah says, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, so it shall be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. We know they didn't repent. <laughs> okay, that's the good news. Oh, my God. The good news is we know that's not going to happen. God's going to have to deal with it. He's going to have to deal with this nation. The good news for us is that he's saying you can be like Noah and you can be like Lot. I get you guys out of it. You will see it, but you will not be destroyed in it. That's the good news. You understand what I'm saying? You will see it as a witness because I need a witness. I need a witness so that others will know that I did this thing and you are my witnesses. You will be in it, but you will not be destroyed by it. You will see the destruction, but it will not come upon you. All right? Will you see some righteous go down? Yes, you will. The righteous will be tested. And many of them are going to fail. You understand what I'm saying? It's not that they weren't righteous. They just will not pass the test. How does he test the righteous? Let me say something. He does not test the righteous with wickedness. He tests the righteous with righteousness. If you see something going on that is wicked, will you come against that wickedness with righteousness? If the answer to that is no and you do nothing, then you are sided with the wicked. You understand what I'm saying? And that's how some who are clothed in righteousness will be lost. That's how some of those who are going to come to him saying, Lord, Lord, are going to say, depart from me. You worked against my commandments. You understand what I'm saying? All right. Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. I could go into the history of that. All right. But uh, um, we see other references to Sodom and Gomorrah, and I'm going to go over. You can just write down these scriptures because we don't have the time. Moses refers to uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and Deuteronomy 29, verses 22 through 23. Those I will read because I have them right here. Your children who follow you in later generations and foreigners who come from distant lands will see the calamities that have fallen on the land and the diseases with which Yahweh has afflicted it. The whole land will be a burning waste of salt and sulfur. Nothing planted, nothing sprouting, no vegetation growing on it. It will be like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which Yahweh overthrew in fierce anger. So that was Deuteronomy 29, verses 22 through 23. You can also look at Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32, verses 32 through 33. In the major prophets, let's go Isaiah chapter 1. We're not turning there. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. Isaiah 1, verses 9 through 10. Isaiah 3, verse 9. Isaiah 3, verse 9. Isaiah 13, verses 19 through 22 addresses people from Sodom and Gomorrah, associates Sodom with shameless sinning, and tells Babylon that it will end like those two cities. Okay, so that was Isaiah chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, Isaiah 3, 9, Isaiah 13, verses 19 through 22. Let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23, verse 14. 
Jeremiah 49, verses 17 through 18. Jeremiah 50, verses 39 through 40. And Lamentations. Lamentations, chapter 4, verse 6. So that was Jeremiah 23, verse 14. Jeremiah 49, verses 17 and 18. Jeremiah 50, 50, verses 39 through 40. Lamentations 4, verse 6. Associate Sodom and Gomorrah with adultery and lies. Prophesies the fate of Edom, south of the Dead Sea. Predicts the fate of Babylon and uses Sodom as a comparison. So we see shameless sinning adultery and lying hello as it was in the days of Lot. ezekiel in ezekiel chapter 16 verses 48 through 50 ezekiel 16 verses 48 through 50 god compares jerusalem to sodom saying sodom never did what you and your daughters have he explains that the sin of Sodom was that she and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Hello? Ezekiel 16. Verses 48 through 50, that is. The minor prophets now. Amos. Amos chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. God tells the Israelites that although he treated them like Sodom and Gomorrah, they still did not repent. Jeez. In Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 9. Zephaniah tells Moab and Ammon, southeast and northeast of the Dead Sea, they will end up like Sodom and Gomorrah. That was Zephaniah 2.9. Let's go New Testament. Matthew <clears throat> chapter 10, verses 1 through 15. The cross reference of that is Luke 10, verses 1 through 12. So that's Matthew 10, verses 1 through 15, with a cross-reference of Luke, chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. Yeshua declares certain cities more damnable than Sodom and Gomorrah due to their response to Yeshua's disciples in the light of greater grace. Greater grace, okay? And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, Shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it shall be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Let me say something. Yeshua says it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. Wait a minute. I thought they were already judged. Uh-uh. There is still a judgment yet to come. Hello? That means there are going to be degrees, varying degrees of judgment for what? Nations. Okay? Matthew 11. Matthew 11, verses 20 through 24. Yeshua prophesied the fate of some cities where he did some of his works. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to hell? You'll be brought down to Hades or hell. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it shall be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. So in cities or nations that have seen the glory of God and yet rejected it, it'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than that nation. Come on. Luke, and that was Matthew 
chapter 11, verses 20 through 24. And Luke 17, verses 28 through 30. Yeshua compares his second coming to the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Okay, that term went out is real key. Strong's number um, G575. Any kind, it means any kind of separation of one thing from another by which the union or fellowship of the two is destroyed. So in other words, the coming out means you are thoroughly separating yourself from it, destroying it so there never can be a bond back again. Come out of her, my people, and touch not the unclean thing. You've got to make up your mind that you've got to separate yourself and not even think about going back to it. In Romans 9, verse 29, Romans 9, 29, Paul the Apostle quotes Isaiah 1, 9. And as Isaiah predicted, if Yahweh Zevaot had not left us children, we would have fared like Sodom and been made like Gomorrah. 2 Peter 2, verses 4 through 10. Peter says that just as God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and saved Lot, he will deliver godly people from temptations and punish the wicked on judgment day. That's a hope, okay? Jude 1, 7, okay, records that both Sodom and Gomorrah were giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So that's where we get that homosexuality and all that. But don't focus on that one point because there was a whole lot around that that goes with that. Revelation 11 verses 7 through 8 makes an allegorical use of when it describes the places where the two witnesses will descend during the apocalypse. Okay? So just as a Sodom, any place that is, if you're doing what they did in Sodom and Gomorrah, if you are behaving as a nation, how they behave in Sodom and Gomorrah, witnesses will rise up to testify against you. Sodom and Gomorrah were known for their lack of hospitality to strangers coming within them. How they cruelly treated them, strangers in their midst. And the commandment is what? Don't oppress the stranger because you were once strangers. Don't, don't oppress the immigrants because you were once immigrants. Hello? I'm sorry, this is not my word. I didn't write this Bible, okay? Our job is simply to open it up, read it, close it, and do what it says to do, all right? This was a very sobering word. I want everyone to pray for the congregation of the Tree of Life. But it also set for me, you remember, guys, we've been saying for a while, we've got to be watchful. That Tree of Life emblem, Hebrew Institute of Studies, makes no bow to doubt it what we are about. You understand what I'm saying? If there is a spirit, oh, where did they arrest that man from? Yesterday, where was he arrested from? Florida. Hello. Okay. Hello. Okay, Florida. All right. So, you know, we need to be on our P's and Q's. All right. We need to be on our P's and Q's. Okay. That's why we be watchful. That front door is closed. The back door has bells on it. And we really need somebody back there. Usually Pam is back there, but someone back there, which is why I like you sitting here where you can see. 
You understand? If the first thing they see is you, Leroy, okay, they're going to run the other way. Okay. <laughs> okay. First thing, all right? You know, so, and that back door back there is closed, okay, also locked so that no one can get in. All right, everybody stand, please. Can you show this sign, Brad? You want to, I don't know if you want to take it and hold it up or you can zoom in. Okay, zoom in on it. Got it? All right. We are not preparing for war, guys. We've been preparing for 18 years. There comes a time when you are no longer under preparation, but you're ready to fight. And we are fighting with the truth. We are fighting with knowing that Yahweh himself is behind us. And how come Gracie and I are wearing the same color combination? White lace, black skirts. <laughs> One mind, hallelujah. Father God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, we bless your holy name. Father, we thank you this day for your presence. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us a word from your mouth to our ears, O Heavenly Father. We thank you, O Heavenly Father, that you have chosen us, O Heavenly Father, not because we were the greatest, because we are the smallest, O Heavenly Father, but you chose us for yourself, plucked us up out, O Heavenly Father, for yourself. So, Father, we just want to thank you, O oh, Heavenly Father, for all that you are revealing and all that you are doing. Father, give us our eyes that we can see, but most of all, give us ears of hearing so that we can understand and know what it is that you would have us to do in these last days. Father, we say a special prayer for the Tree of Life congregation in Pittsburgh, O oh, Heavenly Father. And Lord, we have prayed that you rise up, O oh, Heavenly Father, and take care of the enemies, your enemies, because when they attack your people, God, they are attacking you. They attack the people of the God of Israel. God, we're asking you to rise up, O oh, Heavenly Father. Rise up, O oh, Heavenly Father, for the sake of your people, O oh, Heavenly Father. And Lord, I thank you, oh, Heavenly Father, that as we come before you, we know that you hear us and we know you are with us because you are here with us on this Shabbat, the day of rest, where you are resting in the presence of your people and your people are resting in your presence, oh, Heavenly Father. So we want to praise you and give you the glory. Father, I send a word of healing. Oh, Heavenly Father, to those out there who are suffering, whether it be emotional, whether it be spiritual, whether it be a physical, whether it be financial, whatever they are sick in or have an illness or need healing in, in the name of Yeshua, be healed. And oh, Heavenly Father, I ask you to give us wisdom and knowledge of what it is you would specifically to have us do as you open up this word and open our eyes that we will have the understanding of how it is the calling that you have given us. And Father, we pray for Sierra Leone, oh, Heavenly Father, that they continue in your word, oh, Heavenly Father, and in your will. And we thank you, oh, Lord, that you have joined us to them, oh, Heavenly Father, and that you are giving us wisdom and knowledge on how we are to bring your people into the Torah, oh, Heavenly Father, and in bringing them to the Torah, they will be restored to you and restored to your land in Israel. And we thank you for it in Yeshua HaMashiach's name. Let everyone say amen, amen. All right, while we're getting ready, I'm going to talk to the people online. All right, all right. Who do we have online?